Good evening. Um, thank you for coming. Um, welcome to tonight's uh, talk by Amar Kanwar and Bish Sanyal as the respondent. Um, this is our final talk uh, of the series this fall, so it's a special evening. Um, the Zones of Emergency Lecture Series is um, run together and shared with uh, three courses in the program in Art, Culture, and Technology. Ketamina Zabronis is um, Network Cultures and Participatory Media. Joan Jonas is Performance Workshop, um, as well as the class I teach with Uta Mehta Bauer, uh, Creative Responses to Conflict and Crisis. Uh, before Uta introduces our speaker and respondent tonight, um, I just want to give an overview of uh, the events over the next several weeks. Um, on November 29th, we have visiting artist Florian Hecker, and he will have a panel discussion with uh, ACT professor and director, again, Uta Mehta Bauer here. Um, and Professor of Anthropology, Stefan Helmreich. Again, that's November 29th, 7 p.m. And then on um, December 8th, we have uh, Visions and Projections. This is a special evening celebrating the legacy of the Center for Advanced Visual Studies. And this evening, it will be made up of uh, a lecture, a screening of Center Beam, uh, as well as roundtable discussions involving various members of uh, CABS fellows, former fellows, um, including Otto Pina, who was the professor and director emeritus of CABS. And then on December 9th, um, we have Disobedience, an ongoing video archive. And this is an exhibition um, that is put together by uh, Marco Scottini, as well as Nomeda and Gedamina Zabonas, um, with assistant curator Andreas Bingmanis. And this is in collaboration with students in the class uh, art, architecture, and urbanism, as well as um, introduction to network cultures. And then one last announcement. Um, Joan Jonas' exhibit, My New Theater, Reading Dante Three, is extended until December 2nd. And that is in the Media Lab Complex in the building next door. Thank you, and Uta. Yeah, this is um, indeed our, our last um Evening, our last uh, session in um, the series of Zones of Emergency. And um, for me, it's actually the last session in six years of this lecture series tonight, which is um, quite a special feeling. Uh, we started that six years ago in the Joan Jonas Performance Hall in N51 and N52 in our old location. And um, then we moved over here. It's a little bit more comfortable here. It's maybe less intimate. But uh, the series in, in general was very critical for then the visual arts program and today the program in art, culture and technology. Because with this series we try to open up the field and to have a dialogue between disciplines at MIT and with practitioners from different fields from outside. And to have, for example, as tonight, you have a filmmaker uh, and you have a response from uh, the field of urban studies and development. So we really try to have this dialogue across disciplines on topics that occupy us, on topics where we have shared agency across disciplines. And I think the role of the arts at MIT is exactly that, to bring um, some discussion on topics that we share with our colleagues in other programs, but maybe approach it from a different angle. And uh, it has been very rewarding to see also a continuous um, group of people who shared these evenings with us over the many years that we did that. In spring, I will hand over uh, to my colleague Rene Green, um, who joined us as associate professor from the San Francisco Art Institute um, at this term. And um, I'm really glad to hand over because I think it's also good to have not one uh, specific perspective. In the past, I was running the series in collaboration uh, this term with Chigan Vincent de Paul, and we joined at uh, different courses. Um, as um, Chigan said, with Gerominas Orbonas this term and also with John Jonas. And in the past, I was very closely collaborating with uh, Professor Regina Muller and also with lecturer Amber Fried Jimenez and lecturer Jerem Lee um, in putting together the program already from different um, angles. Um, so it is very special to me tonight to have the last one in that series, and I hope the torch moves on uh, very productively. I'm pretty convinced about that. So really stay tuned and come back in spring um, when we start the series again. Um, I also want to thank um, Laura Anka Kikison, our uh, coordinator for public programs at ACT, Chris Klepper, who is in charge of um, uh, the technology, technological side of our courses, but also uh, supporting us here when we have public events. Um, my 
co um, lecturer this term, Chigan Vincent de Poel, Marion Cunningham, our managing director, and uh, Lisa Hickler, uh, our admi administrative assistant. Also, I want to thank the three TAs of our classes, Nadine uh, Rolicher, Elizabeth Watkins, and Slobodan Radoman for their support. And last but not least, I want to thank Andrew Newman, who is recording every talk to bring it up on the blog for those who miss it, but also we have quite um, a wide um, global um, audience for those um, talks. So now I want to come for to tonight. Um, so Zones of Emergency, Creative Responses to Conflict and Crisis is really trying uh, to tackle uh, where does the cultural sector have an impact in such situations, in such landscapes. And we don't mean it in the sense of instrumentalizing art and culture, of solving the problem, rather of being part of the, um, the group of people who try to um, find out the problem or even like uh, being a seismographic kind of antenna who even understands maybe in a different angle of what is going on. And in this respect, um, I'm really glad to have Ama Kanwar back here. Um, uh, Ama Kanwar is a filmmaker and artist who is based in New Delhi. And uh, it's a second time that he speaks in this series. Um, the Other Zones of Emergency series took place about like four years ago, or is it five years? I mean, it's quite quite some time ago. But we also had the pleasure to collaborate on several occasions, including Documenta 11, but also um, in um, what's left, what remains in Mexico City. Um, Amar's work, like beside of being a well-known filmmaker, but Amar, I also see him um, as very much engaged as a humanist and um, really sharing the endeavors of like human rights and um, what, what is freedom of speech um, in different parts of this globe. And um, Amar in his practice creates documentary based multi-channel installations but also uh, single screen uh, films uh, that deal with the politics of power, violence, sexuality and justice. In the torn first pages, Amar unfolds a struggle for democracy in Myanmar. Uh, in this, in, and in his eight-channel video piece, the lightning testimonies that has been uh, on display on uh, Documenta 12, um, he reflected upon a history of conflict in the Indian subcontinent through the experiences of sexual violence against women during and after the 1947 partition. Amar's work has been shown in museums across the globe, like from MoMA to you name it, like Tate Modern, in, in many places of this globe. But And he received numerous awards for his works. Also, he holds an um, honorary uh, degree of uh, Portland um, University. And um, But what always struck me is this ongoing debate um, on, on what are human rights and how can we negotiate through, as Amar calls it, living languages that include poetry, music, filmmaking, writing, to negotiate another space. And um, I think this is why, to me, that was always very encouraging to see there is an effect, there, there it has an impact to raise those voices and it will be heard. And um, also, I'm pleased to hear that Amar is participating also in Next Documenta in Kassel. I think you're the first uh, artist from India who ever participated in three documentas. I mean, not many artists in general, participated in three iterations of Documenta, but I'm really pleased um, that we will see another, for sure, major work on that. I'm also very glad that Bish Sanyal, who is really <laughs> pretty busy person on this campus, agreed um, to serve as a respondent to Amar's presentation. Bish Sanyal is a Ford International Professor of Urban Development and Planning, and he is also the director of the special program in urban and regional studies spurs uh, at MIT, where he also is a Humphrey, where he also leads the Humphrey Fellows Program. Um, Bristan Yal also joined, he joined MIT in 1984. He served as the head of the Department of Urban Studies and Planning from 1994 to 2002, and he also was the chair of MIT's faculty at large from 2007 and 2009. Um, his research and publications and leadership experience reflect the multidisciplinary nature of the field of urban planning here at MIT and for those who are not from MIT, um, the DES program as it's called, Department of Urban Studies and Planning, is the number one in this country 
and it's really less of a traditional planning program rather than uh, based on social science and um, exploring really the field from very different angles, which makes it so unique. Um, Mr. Sanyal has degrees in architecture and city planning, and he has a strong interest in the interconnection between the developing world and the United States. He, uh, Sanyal has long held interest in international planning, also planning education, um, and he's currently heading an effort to create the first private university of urban and regional planning in India. Uh, he developed, he developed uh, two edited volumes, Hidden Successes and History of Planning Ideas. And um, this kind of collaborative um, effort of engaging in also what is changing in the urban landscape has brought us, us together over the last few years um, that I have been serving as an associate professor on this campus. But now with no further ado, let us welcome both um, Amar Kanwar and Bish Sanyal. Um, thank you, Uta. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Thank you for coming. It's, um, I think I just, I, I probably have to begin with, um, with just a few thoughts about, in a sense, how, how difficult I think it is to actually talk about uh, the subject that, that you have, I mean, at least the frame of, of conflict and interventions and so on. And that it's, it's, uh, it's always very perplexing as to how do you, uh, you know, how do you, how do you present this experience? Uh, in what form do you present this experience? I mean, is it a lecture? Is it, are you describing an achievement? Uh, is it, uh, uh, it, I've always, uh, I found it quite difficult to figure it out in, in that what is the form of how I would communicate or how one can communicate. And it's not something that I've resolved either. I think it's to some extent, um, uh, given the past lectures, uh, uh, perhaps probably the best thing to do is uh, to see this as a series of conversations from different people. But even then, um, uh, a conversation you know, continues in a way. It goes back and forth. So it's, it's actually, I, I think it's, it's difficult really to, uh, to, at least for me, to specifically speak like that about an intervention. There are other reasons also. Um, uh, for instance, one is trying to speak about a very long period of time. Uh, you know, I mean, an intervention takes, or, or an engagement takes, takes place over five years. In my case, I'm trying to talk about something that uh, a time span of about 10 or 12 years which is again difficult to do, to, to, to put together. It's tough to talk about anything that long. Uh, I think perhaps what uh, I'm going to be doing is uh, um, occasionally and briefly and maybe inadequately referring to certain things uh, or certain attempts or certain uh, kind of engagements or experiments that I tried over the last few years in a particular area as well as uh, um, you know, talk about issues that would come up while thinking through those attempts. Uh, I will also try and show some still images and, and, and so on as we go along. Um, and uh, so it's uh, it, the, the other problem that I, I faced even while trying to figure, figure this presentation out was is just the whole question of the conflict itself because it seems it's always so fluid. It's very hard to describe, uh, you know, what kind of conflict. And there was there's there are so many issues. First, for instance, is that, uh, you know, is 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 this a conflict outside? Is this a conflict inside? Uh, there are, uh, you know, why is this uh, desire to go to a conflict that's far away? Um, if you're born in a conflict, is there a certain relationship with the conflict? And is there a certain relationship or a certain context? to your participating in or intervening in or engaging in. And if, if you're not born there and you go somewhere else, then is, 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 is it a completely different dimension? Um, and I, I found this as a filmmaker. Uh, and if there are filmmakers here, they would know um, certainly that every time you go out to, to film or every time you go further away to film from your own home, 
a whole set of questions come up, you know, which is the why are you going, for what reason, for whom, what are you trying to make, um, is this the only time that you're going, what's the, what's the meaning of the relationship, how, I, I mean, is, what is the meaning of the trust that you are uh, developing, is the trust that you're developing for the film, um, uh, also, how long are you going to be there? Are you going to come back there? How many times are you going to come back? Are you going to be accessible afterwards or not? For how long are you going to be accessible? Um, again, uh, when you go in or when you go or when you engage, uh, are you, uh, uh, I mean, is it, is, is it a bleeding heart that is driving you? Is, is, what is the nature of disturbance that is driving you? Um, is, it, uh, is it because uh, uh, you want to, in a sense, kind of uh, rescue somebody? Do you end up in a certain way uh, uh, representing uh, somebody? Uh, are you comfortable with representing uh, somebody? Uh, do they want you, want you to represent them? Are you going to begin not representing them, but over a period of time end up representing them? Uh, what would be the implications of you representing them over a period of time? Uh, would their perception of you change over a period of time? And these, uh, I mean, put, put together, they seem a hell of a lot of questions, but uh, it's, it, it is a, it's, it's, it's very hard. Uh, it's, it, it, is, it is like a, a, a set of uh, kind of dilemmas in a way uh, that, uh, that at least I felt and I think most, uh, most people have to in some sense resolve. Uh, not just resolve for themselves in their head but probably resolve in the course of the work as well. Uh, then there's this, you know, there's, a, there's, this, there's this other kind of problem which is um, which is that, that conflicts itself are so fluid. Uh, the, the, the positions of various individuals, people, organizations within the conflict change over a period of time. So, you know, somebody in one, uh, uh, they, they, you know, people withdraw, people get broken, people become extreme. Uh, so, uh, and everybody has their own reasons and, and maybe even valid reasons. So, Again, uh, where do you identify yourself with? If at all you do identify yourself, um, then there's this there's this other. Uh, I mean, there are so many issues, but there's this other thing that that problem that that has been coming up for quite some time now is that uh, sometimes you 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 get a sense that there's a conflict situation that is uh, actually uh, continuing, and it seems that it is being kept on the boil for a certain amount of time. Almost as if there is, a, there is an advantage in, in, in maintaining a disturbed area, a disturbed geographical area. Uh, if you can maintain a, an area disturbed over a period of time, then a, a new uh, kind of a new paradigm, a uh, new legislative paradigm can come into place in that. In, in that area, a new set of a new way of dealing with that area can can get in, enforced over over some time. Um, so again, it's very tricky uh, that uh, if if a conflict is being sustained by various people, whether it's by the government or whether it's by players inside the conflict, um, then then what is your role going to be? Uh, and none of these questions are simple, but in some senses they need to be. I think asked and, and continuously asked. Uh, very soon when you get into a conflict area, you also realize that, um, that it, a conflict attracts a lot of people. Uh, and it attracts a lot of people from outside. And so if you're coming from outside, then you're also another one coming in from outside. And everybody's, everybody's intentions are up to be scrutinized. Uh, um, everybody's objectives are to be seen and, and, and there has to be a reason why you're there which is clear enough. Um, you also realize that, that uh, it seems that every, every conflict needs uh, people to, to kind of uh, create a space of dialogue as well. Uh, 
uh, and that there is a there is a politics of resolution as well, or there is a politics of, uh, um, in some senses, uh, you know, I think maybe maybe softening uh, the severity of the conflict or making it livable for a certain period of time. Uh, it's quite clear uh, many times that. Uh, People who perpetuate conflicts are actually also bringing in people uh, uh, to negotiate conflict and to intervene in conflict and in, 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 uh, you know, in managerial ways, in cultural ways, in artistic ways. And, and the entire terrain becomes very complicated. Um, there's a lot of conflict attracts a lot of money. Uh, and, and, and so that also makes, uh, makes the issue difficult. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, in a sense, um, listing all these things in a way because I, I feel that they have been essential. They, they, are, they may cripple you, they may, uh, you know, confront you, and, and one has to find a way through them. And of course, there is this other issue as well, which I think all of us face, and especially like a filmmaker going in, is that is the whole question of success and the whole question of speed and time, that you, you need to be successful. You need to show success. There has to be an impact. And, you know, uh, and what are the tools in which your success is therefore going, you know, your success is going to be evaluated. And again, you, you, need to be, you need to find a way to be able to confront this expectation, as well as the, the, the tools of, of success. Uh, obviously, you, you know, if, they, if you're in a hurry, then your haste is seen very clearly and pretty immediately. Um, about, uh, I think, in, perhaps in 1999, I, uh, uh, I was worried about all these questions, and it, in, in, in some senses, would also hesitate uh, to, to proceed. Uh, in 1999, I did, I thought, was quite a simple uh, little kind of exercise. Uh, which is that I, I collected uh, for a few months uh, several, you know, scanning several newspapers, magazines, financial papers, uh, looking essentially for um, agreements between in, in international gov you know, governments and the Indian government or state governments or corporations and state governments or visits of you know, certain various kind of representatives of different corporations. And uh, I, I kept kind of marking these clippings uh, for over, say, three or, four year, uh, three or four year time period around the late 90s, maybe even up to the, uh, 2000 or 2001. And uh, after collecting all of that, I decided to just map them and just see where, where do they all cluster and come together. Uh, not, not that I'm getting any special advice from anybody. It's just a very kind of rudimentary exercise to see how many MOUs or how many agreements or how many meetings are taking place over what issue in which geographical area. And um, pretty immediately, I, you know, one could see certain clusters. And one of, just, one of the things that came out pretty clear uh, and this is, uh, of course, you are, you have, I'm sure, been hearing of the, you know, the great Indian economy boom and, and all that. But this is, this is the beginning of it, in a sense, uh, or the beginning of one being able to see it happening on the ground uh, in the late 90s. And um, mapping these uh, newspaper clippings, uh, the things that came up immediately were that there seemed to be a concentration in the alpine. Uh, regions in the Himalaya regions, uh, and there seemed to be a lot of uh, pharmaceutical interest in in that region. Uh, quite obviously, for uh, uh, biological and medicinal plant uh, work and extraction, in a sense, uh, there seemed to be uh, quite a large amount of interest uh, and agreements uh, on, in, on the coastal plains, uh, and a lot of. Uh, uh, indications towards uh, industrial zones on the coast, as well as uh, the making of uh, not 5, 10, 15, but several dozen uh, ports, big and small ports. The third cluster 
that uh, that emerged was uh, the eastern uh, eastern ghats which is uh, the uh, the hill ranges on the east of india which i will um, and uh, as you can see in the in the region where uh, of the red uh, square uh, and these, uh, the, this is, these are hill ranges that go across the uh, eastern coast into Chhattisgarh, through Orissa, down even into Andhra. And um, several meetings were, uh, several M MOUs were concentrated in these areas. And uh, what I began to do was actually to start to travel in, in all the three areas, uh, essentially to see uh, what was happening. Uh, I'm not uh, going to focus on what I saw in the alpine regions or what I saw on the coastal areas, but I'm going to focus on, on the state of Orissa uh, and on the eastern Ghats, which is primarily uh, what it seemed initially were mining, mining interests uh, from all over the world. And uh, I remember in my, um, the first time that I went there, I, uh, I found these, uh, you know, this comment about how suddenly, uh, you know, a road would appear. A road appeared which actually had no beginning point and had no ending point. And it was very perplexing as to why should a road in a rural area pretty out of, uh, you know, connection with anybody should, should be, you know, good tarmac road come up. Uh, and it took a few years uh, for everybody to figure out locally that, um, the, the initially, the rationale given was to connect interior uh, forest uh, market produce to markets outside and to help indigenous communities and peasants to access markets. But later on, uh, you realize that the beginning was the, 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 the road network very clearly fitted into requirements of water and bauxite and, and an aluminum plant. And uh, what was startling is that the the time span between actually constructing the road and bringing in of the infrastructure was several years, uh, four to five to six years almost. So uh, there had been a fair amount of foresight in a sense, the road being positioned as something that was required agriculturally, but in effect had uh, you know, other intentions. Uh, in, in essentially what, what I found while traveling, especially in Orissa was um, uh, to give you uh, just a kind of an illustration of what it meant was that I, I learned that people had, through the late 90s, uh, begun to wake up to this uh, phenomena, in a sense, of uh, a hill range actually being sold, leased out for several years. So it's, it's, not, it's not a patch of land or it's not an area, but it's it's pretty much as far as your eye can see. Uh, and then again, it was not one hill range, but it was two, three, four, several hill ranges. And these were uh, basically hill ranges containing bauxite. Uh, several times there were reservoirs that were irrigation reservoirs that, that seemed to uh, be, become or proceeding to become, in a sense, to be leased out or to be out of bounds or to be used again for prospective industry that is to come. Um, quite um, quite immediately, I I, uh, I learned that here were uh, several instances of uh, hamlets, in a sense, not not one village, maybe, but three or four villages, quite autonomously uh, with local uh, kind of leadership, um, resisting fairly large national and international companies. Uh, and had been doing this not for six months or eight months, but even by 99, 2000, 2001, had been doing this for maybe four years, five years and six years. Uh, and it was, I was completely taken aback and completely amazed by, uh, just by, by the resilience of, of, of these local uh, groups, communities and villages. Uh, I was also quite startled by the uh, by the fact that there was no information really about it uh, anywhere in the national press or outside. Uh, 
what was also uh, shocking for me was the fact that there was a lot of discourse about this whole process uh, happening within Orissa. That is between the local communities, the government, the police, the, the NGOs. Uh, uh, the, the discussions were also happening in terms of the extent in which um, uh, NGOs would confront. Uh, there were lists of NGOs who were supporting local communities. They were being banned. There was, there was quite a debate taking place, and this debate was quite well informed, uh, not just about, uh, in a sense, the politics of resistance or the strategies of resistance, but also about the various kinds of uh, economic uh, forces or interests or groups that were coming in. Of course, um, uh, conflict resolution people were also coming in uh, all over the place. Uh, uh, of course, banks had insured. Uh, companies have been are aware of the fact that there will be resistance and there will be delays. And so they have insured themselves over a few years for a few years of meeting local resistance. Uh, and can deal with financially four or five years of opposition. Uh, in, in this, in this uh, um, uh, terrain, in a sense, uh, I began to film. And uh, I'm, uh, it's not that I have a great conclusion to make at the end of this lecture. I'm just simply sharing the things that I did in this area and, and, and the issues and the doubts that come to my mind. And, uh, the directions that it leads me to. Uh, that's, I made three, to start off with, I made three films. And um, I want to just briefly talk about, I'm not showing the films, they're films of different duration. I just want to briefly talk about three films. One of the films I did was called The Many Faces of Madness. The second one was a film called Pardon? Somebody said something. Okay. It's a computer thing. Okay. <laughs> the, the, the second film was a film called Bapli Mali 173, which was the name of a hill that contained 173 million tons of bauxite. And the third film was a film called Freedom. Uh, I, I, if, if um, each of these films had, in a sense, had a different objective. And after just describing the three films briefly, I will refer to some of the issues that seem to come out during and uh, the making of the film and subsequently also showing these films. Uh, what I was interested in this film essentially was one that I would be, if I could, if I could make something that I could speak uh, to um, a wide audience, uh, a literate audience, an educated audience, a business audience, a head of state audience, a company audience, uh, and outside the state of Orissa. But um, which, which is what one did with the film. But what I was also really interested in was um, two images that I found, which were essentially holes, drilling holes of various shapes and sizes all across these hill ranges. Um, and uh, in a sense, this, uh, the local communities coming face to face with, with these holes suddenly appearing, uh, with people surveying teams, drilling teams coming uh, from outside. Uh, and I filmed quite a few locations where, uh, where, in, in a, where these drilling holes were. And they, to some extent, became a kind of a marker of what was to come. Um, the, the second film, which is called Bapli Mali, and you have a, a kind of a glimpse of the cover uh, here, was again about um, the small resistances that were coming up, especially uh, around the Bapli Mali Hill Range. And uh, what, I, uh, what was for me hard to forget and an incredible moment while, while filming this was, and in a way, you know, coming together with the intention that I had with this film was 
um, a tribal a young man uh, from that area um, while while talking uh, i think it's a, it's it's a pity that he had to reach this point to say this but this is what he said and he said uh, he said i have a skull uh, and inside the skull is a brain and this brain can think and it can see and it can analyze and it, it can juxtapose and it can decide what makes sense and what doesn't make sense and what is good and what is not good. Now, on the face of it, it's a fairly simple statement or a fairly simple set of statements. But, but for me, it was, it was quite tragic that one had a system or that we had all in some sense forced this young man to reach a point when he is feeling the need to actually communicate to everybody around that he can do the simplest of things, which is that he can think. Uh, that he is feeling the need to actually communicate to people around that he, he is intelligent and that he has intelligence. And uh, for me, this, the, this film was actually about thinking, about the local community actually going through the process of thinking. This, this image that you see here is, is um, dried effluent from the aluminum plants. Uh, if you remember the leak on the Danube just a little while back uh, with the red mud effluent uh, down the Danube and in Europe, um, there are uh, very massive um, lakes here of the red mud effluent uh, in various parts in, in where the aluminum uh, production is taking place and the extraction is. Uh, but again, coming back to this whole question of um, of juxtaposing and analyzing the, uh, the villages around the hill of Baplimali uh, travel in the film to another location where there is an aluminum plant uh, and take samples of, of the soil, of the water, and of the area uh, to, to essentially compare and come to a conclusion and decision about their opposition to the product, uh, to the project. Uh, the, the third film uh, was a film called Freedom, and it arose out of uh, a, a, a kind of a request from people within in Orissa, wherein um, a, a need in some senses was expressed about the need to be able to connect outside Orissa with events that have been taking place over a period of time in other parts of the country. Uh, so I did this uh, fairly long film, uh, um, simply shot, um, traveling all over. But I picked uh, what I could describe as a point of no return, um, a, a point of complete despair, uh, a, a local resistance of five years old, a, a, a resistance that was 40 years old, a, a citizen's resistance, an extreme left resistance, an urban resistance. Um, a, a very large political organization over 20, 25 years working uh, on many issues of land and livelihood and ecology and mining, uh, and, and uh, did a, a, a journey filming through many of these. Uh, these the, the image that you see here is, is of a retired army officer uh, who, um, uh, after about 40 years of serving the Indian Army, retired and went back to his own village. Uh, and being the only or the most educated man in the village on the coast of Gujarat, um, joins a local um, association to protect the, uh, the coastline from the coming in of a, of a port uh, by the government. And I think in collaboration with you know Cal at that, I'm not sure what the, uh, the, the, the international partner was. Um, as has happened in several places, the, the, the local mobilization becomes strong. Uh, the police uh, come in and begin to crack down. Many people are arrested. Um, Colonel Save, one of them, is, is picked up and uh, beaten to death in prison in, in, with full witnesses of other prisoners. Um, so uh, these three films uh, became a kind of a trilogy of a kind. 
uh, with Orissa in, 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 in the heart of them. And uh, I, I started to show them. But there are, there are a whole set of issues that come out again, um, especially when, if you are if you're making films like this or if, if you are working in a conflict area. And of course, the first thing that obviously comes out is the whole question of propaganda. That um, uh, who are you representing? Are you going to be objective and are you not going to be objective? Are you going to put both sides of the view and so on and so forth? And I'm not getting into that debate, but I think it's essential to just to bring it up. Uh, but there are more, there are another set of dilemmas that come up, which is that if you're working in a conflict area, and I think pretty much in whichever areas that you're working in, and if you're working in as a filmmaker making films, then, then the question of, uh, in, of inspiring uh, always seems to come up, which is, which is a, an expectation of making a film that inspires people. Uh, then there's another expectation that comes up, which is, um, which is about how, how uh, militant or how radical or how confrontative uh, is the film. And, and uh, most work starts getting assessed. Uh, in a mainstream way, work starts, you know, if you see a lot of documentary, documentaries or documentary films, you see they get burdened by the whole, by the, in a sense, by the weight of the, uh, of, a, of, a, of the narrative arc of uh, holding attention on television. But on the other hand, uh, within the conflict area, you're also getting burdened by, uh, does the film inspire people enough? Uh, is it confrontative enough? Is it radical enough? Um, and um, very soon, if you work for a, a longer period of time, there's another issue that comes up, and that comes up, I think, wherever you go, which is that can you, can you be critical of the political movement that you're working in alliance with? Can you, can you critique uh, <coughs> the leadership positions of, of those areas that you're working in? Uh, can you critique them personally? Can you critique them ideologically? Can you critique them polit politically? Can you critique them in, with the same severity and, and strength by which you're actually critiquing, say, industry or government or police or uh, so-called the opponents in that sense? Uh, and the moment you, you start uh, getting into, the, into that position or even exploring that position, your whole um, uh, your, your own position in that area uh, becomes very complicated. Um, would you then choose not to comment on the, say, um, in a sense, the, the oppression of the people whom you're trying to represent, say, for instance? Um, or would you, would you subsequently bring it up later? Would you keep working over a period of time to start drawing in your own uh, you know these issues into your own work later, and for me these things are critical, and one has to find a way to address them. Uh, obviously, uh, after making these films and after translating these films uh, in in um, in the local language as well, uh, came the issue of uh, showing them. And um, so began a period of actually showing these films. And when you show a set of films, another thing that came up, which is that there must be more films. Um, and what I did was that at this point, I think this was, again, a, a early part of 2000. I invited, I raised certain money from, from my films and elsewhere, and I invited journalists to come to this area and to start to write. And so I helped them in different ways, logistically as well as uh, in meeting people, but not really directing what they have to write about. And my, my concern and my interest really was that, in some sense, people should be uh, reporting about this, and there should be a presence of uh, of, of what is happening. I'm going to show you some, um, uh, some, some of the, a, a kind of, uh, kind of sweep of the, of the writings that came out. Um, this was done over another year and year and a half.
you could see the backlash in a sense. This is on the coast of Kutch in Gujarat. You know Cal. What, what becomes pretty clear from this is essentially what we are going to see. This is a list of memorandum of understandings in the Eastern Ghats, in, the, in, in, these, in this entire belt. Uh, probably there's not very much you have to say, you know, if you just go through this and just you take a, take a cursory look at it at least. Is it clearer? Mm Imagine the scale of the operation. We can't really see it. We can't see no, these are just lists of cement plants, cement plants, steel plants, power plants, power plants, power plants, power plants agreements signed. Um, and they go on. Um, and we are not talking about five steel plants or ten steel plants. We are talking about rings of 30 steel plants, 40 steel plants, 40 power plants. Uh, and <coughs> one of the things that that became pretty clear again at this point was that what we are what we are begun to witness over there in Orissa and in in Chhattisgarh and in the neighboring areas was that this was going to be uh, a fairly severe onslaught in a sense, not just on natural resources, but on local livelihoods, on villages. There will be widespread resistance uh, locally, organized as well as unorganized. Uh, this region would become highly uh, disturbed, um, and there would be a lot of violence. Uh, anybody going through the news uh, in the last few years in Chhattisgarh, uh, even vaguely, would. Uh, we're familiar with uh, the, the large areas of the state actually being inaccessible because of an extreme conflict between, say, the Maoist extreme left underground and the police with, with this scale of industrial operation, operation being envisaged. Uh, uh, the same uh, situation has been developing in Orissa as well. Uh, it is also quite clear to see that uh, in such a situation, um, a, a middle space is also very difficult to retain uh, as the severity of the uh, uh, kind of appropriation of this land increases and as the severity of the conflict increases, um, you know, how are you going to intervene and who is going to intervene and who is going to listen to who is in, uh, when you're intervening as well. Uh, one of the things that became clear again at that point was that no matter how much I filmed, uh, what one really needed was for people to film here. Uh, we needed a, a, a large amount of uh, image production to take place locally within the state 
so that one is able to actually get an idea of what really is happening. And uh, so what I started to do was uh, collect my films and start to show my films slowly over a period of time, following which I began to collect other films, films from other filmmakers, and, and move towards creating some form of a collection. Um, the collection proceeded to uh, holding a film festival. And uh, we went from one film festival in the first year to the second year to the third year. And um, again, the idea was that when, um, when you're able to uh, collect films uh, and show them regularly over a period of time, uh, it, is, it is going to attract. And it is going to attract people locally who not only just come to see, but also want to respond and make and so on, which is, again, what we started to do was to draw in as much attention as we could. Uh, it's very clear that with this, with, with this kind of severe takeover uh, of these communities and of agriculture and of natural resources, uh, artistically, culturally, um, uh, politically, there is a need, they, one has to find a way to respond to this uh, and would need to be able to project a response to this over a period of time. Uh, what I'd like to uh, show you, for instance, is that we, with, with local activists and myself, what we began to do was to uh, find individuals who wanted, in a sense, to, in a way to respond to what was happening around them, in their own villages, in their own areas, and worked on a series of kind of informal uh, pedagogic processes or uh, almost like workshop processes to, 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 to try and uh, find the option of making. And I'm, I'm going to show you something uh, that gives you an idea of what you get which is And these are these are essentially local conflicts taking place over the acquisition of land. And are filmed locally by people within the villages. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
The, the collection of films, the showing of films, the forming of a kind of an archive, in a sense sustaining uh, the screenings and ma making the film festival happen over a period of time drew in a lot of interest and drew in people who were interested in making films, in making images and in being able to respond to what was happening to their own area. Sometimes with me, with us and sometimes on their own, but in many ways this began to ripple. Between us, I am giving you an idea of um, uh, another process that emerged which is uh, of compilations <coughs> of stories, films, footage that was shot across the state in different areas um, being sold and distributed at very uh, cheap prices across the state. And these are five volumes uh, of uh, films, short films uh, made over, over a few years. of which I'll show you uh, one clip. <coughs> I'll show you just the smallest. April Kodiya Tariko Duhajarat Mosia Tinkia Patna Ebong Govind Pura Gramavasi Kojut Kuitile Package Podi Pine Posco Company Roth Hoitan Prastava Patro Kuriku Podagala उसको कंपनी 5525 एकड़ उर्वर जमीन चाहे इस्पात कारखाना और बंदर निर्माण पाएं इन मेनी वेज इस द द क्वेश्चन ऑफ व्हाट इज द नेचर ऑफ व्हाट आर वी गोइंग टू डायलॉग अबाउट आर वी गोइंग टू डायलॉग अबाउट द राइट अबाउट आवर राइट टू नॉट लीव और आर वी गोइंग टू डायलॉग अबाउट व्हाट इज द व्हाट इज द कंटेंट ऑफ द रिहैबिलिटेशन पैकेज दैट यू आर गोइंग टू ऑफर and, and, and many of these villages want to take the position that they are not wanting to dialogue on rehabilitation. They are wanting to dialogue on their right to, to not leave if they do not want to leave. Um, These are some more images of local protests in the same area where this film was made. And this is just some months back, this is quite recent. And these are actually one of the most remarkable nonviolent resistances that are taking place locally. Uh, in, in, in this particular area in Dinkia, but also in, in other parts of the state where, where um, basically people have no option left.
it is a situation of war in a sense. Uh, I'd like to just conclude uh, by saying that in a way this, um, I have been giving you glimpses of various processes, but in a way this multiplied and, and uh, we have a fair amount of uh, a process of image making taking place. But there is very clearly a problem again that one faces when one is working in this area, um, which is that uh, which is about, which is to do with the, with the way of understanding or, or a way of expression or a way of communicating without doubt that there is a mainstream uh, uh, way of communicating. There is a mainstream way of news, there is a mainstream way of representing people, there is a mainstream way of arguing, of articulating, of making a point. Uh, there is, uh, th this, this vocabulary or this language also ha is very attractive and has a power. And whatever we produce locally uh, over a short period of time starts to emulate or m move towards this, this mainstream space, either to try and enter it or to try and influence it or to try and imitate it. And as this thing, you know, as this trajectory takes place, it, it in a way loses its own meaning and its, 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 uh, its vocabulary. Um, the other problem that, uh, that we face is, is, is even more uh, peculiar, which is that when you see something like some of the images that I just showed you, when you see something like this hap happening, um, you expect a response uh, from the mainstream in a sense. You expect a response from people all around and when you do not see a response then it makes you wonder as to, um, you know, what, what is the, uh, where lies the problem in, in, in comprehending what actually is a scene of crime? Uh, why is it so difficult for anybody to understand what is happening? Or why is it so difficult for people not to realize uh, th that this is a scale of, you know, multiple devastations that are taking place and that this is, that people have the right uh, to stop it from happening. And um, in such a situation, it gives rise to another proposition, therefore, in, in terms of addressing these problems, which is that um, uh, if, if uh, no amount of representation, if no amount of image, image making is actually impacting upon this mainstream population that is living around these areas, uh, then uh, how do you proceed? Uh, is, uh, you know, at first I used to think that if you, uh, uh, the, the reason why there is no comprehension is because, uh, you know, there is no dialogue and that we needed to have dialogue. And, uh, and after a while, it became super articulation on, on both sides and, and nobody was comprehending really. And then uh, I began to feel that probably um, it's not just dialogue, but what we need to do is to learn how to listen. Maybe if we learn how to listen, then we'll comprehend. And if we comprehend, we'll be able to respond or feel or act. Uh, but after a while, you know, it didn't make any sense because even if you learn to listen, the, the other person wouldn't stop. Um, so then uh, I think uh, I began to feel probably, you know, before we even get to dialoguing or listening, I think probably what we need to do is uh, maybe learn to look and uh, to see just, just that if, if there's a certain way of seeing, maybe there's a certain way of feeling and maybe there's a certain way of comprehending. Um, which is not, uh, I'm not making a, a, a metaphoric uh, proposition. Um, what I'm saying is that uh, perhaps that if we have the scene of crime, like I showed you several images of, and, it's, and people are not comprehending what is happening at the scene of crime, um, uh, then the, the reason why people are not comprehending what is happening at the scene of crime is because uh, the evidence that is being placed on the table about the scene of crime is being defined by the law of the land. The law of the land is permitting a certain kind of evidence.
to be tabled. And we are only being able to see that evidence that is being presented on the table. Um, so, um, in a way, I make the proposition that perhaps, uh, of course, you need forensic evidence on the table uh, to investigate, to understand, to conclude, to make a judgment on, on, on the crime. Uh, but I go as far as to, uh, to make a proposition that uh, perhaps what we need is um, maybe another vocabulary. Perhaps what we need is poetry. Uh, alongside the forensic evidence on the table to understand the scene of crime. Uh, now, obviously, this proposition is, is, is a hypothetical proposition, that if, if you were to permit me to place poetry on the table, uh, I think you will be able to understand the scene of crime differently. Uh, so uh, the only way you can uh, test this hypothesis out is, uh, is to test it, is to allow me to test it. So uh, uh, the next step, uh, that is from uh, the press clippings, from making the films to the collection, to the archive, to the film festival, to the teaching, to the making, uh, the next step actually is uh, to present the evidence publicly. To find, uh, in order to present the evidence, we need a space, we need a location, we need a venue. Um, and uh, so this is where we are actually heading, that, uh, that we find a space to present the evidence that we have accumulated about the scene of crime. The moment we present this evidence, the first thing that is going to come up, according to me, possibly, is that this evidence is inadequate and that there is far more evidence that exists. And uh, so possibly what we have, therefore, is that either the, the more evidence that exists, that needs to be added to this, our inadequate evidence, um, or we need to shift this space out from where, at least I have located, to another place where more evidence is accessible. Uh, again, this is not a metaphoric proposition. This is a tangible proposition and a real proposition. And um, it, uh, it throws open the question uh, immediately for all of us engaged there is that, uh, you know, what is this space that can contain this evidence? And in many other ways, what is a civil rights movement? What is a civil rights museum? And what is a collection that responds to a civil rights issue in a contemporary political scenario. Thank you. We will go immediately to the response by Pish Sanyal, and I just want to mention that um, um, Amar's uh, projects are usually always like multi-year long projects that partly run also in parallel and um, uh, the first one, Pages, which engages in Myanmar, or like in former Burma, is a similar project and um, I think that is also interesting to understand why Amar left kind of the cinema as a space entering also the art context because it offers a more multi-layered space where you un can unfold the filmmaking in a very different kind of way, which you saw um, Amar explaining here. And um, please let's also welcome Vish oh, Sanyal. Thank you. I think I have this. Well, first of all, I want to thank Uta and also Jigan for organizing these zones of emergency. And I particularly want to thank Uta for her contribution to the program and to MIT. And I hope that the conversation she started um, here over the last five or six years, that we are able to continue this. It's remarkable for you to, in, to introduce these issues in the conversation in the Institute of Technology. Really, most, we are most grateful, and we will miss you. Um, I think Amar's presentation, it's honor to respond to Amar and his work and the sensitivity and the political 
awareness with which he has done this work, I think it's a very, very important work. Um, there are many issues that Amma raised, and I generally I agree with the basic framework of the cost of development, economic development, and particularly the the cost development imposes on people at the local level in terms of changing their livelihood, uh, changing their, their culture um, in many different ways. Um, Amar ended with this, whether we need poetry, as when I was thinking poetry as opposed to economic doctrines, or economic theories, would be a wonderful way to sensitize the issue. The, the question is, for me, why is this message not getting across? And uh, it's not a new, new message of the, of the pain of dislocation and the role of, of businesses in, in this kind of a massive development process. And what I'm reminded of that in the 19, early 70s, actually, that was maybe 25 years after development started in India, was independent in 47. Um, there was a reaction, and, and the Chhattisgarh movement, of course, is now exploding, but the, the Indian Naxalite movement started in the mid 60s, 1960s, actually, and actually parallel with what's happening in China. And um, so it's not a new movement, and it brought a lot of conversations and discussions about development and its goal, not only in India, but in many other countries. So the development paradigm of economic development with multinationals moving in, exploiting the mineral resources, et cetera, it's not a new, new point. Uh, but it has to be told again and again, as, as Amar said in many, many different ways. What I was thinking is, the, the dominant paradigm of development, which is still very strong, and we need to understand why is it still so strong. And you know, it has this very kind of coherent paradigm of growth and change and how income gets improved and how income distribution is affected, how local scenarios are not necessarily always that great, that there's a lot of local injustice. So there's a whole package of stories that that go under development theory. And what I think Amar is trying to do is to counter that narrative. And I am looking for his narrative, in his narrative, um, what are the surprises for me? Because I've followed this for, for, for some time, not only in India, in other countries. And what um, struck me, two things I want to say. One is that the counter narrative that first emerged against development in the early 70s, in the theories of post-developmentalism, uh, particularly the term post-developmentalism, was couched as um, portraying government as a source of control, social control, and power, which it is. But it's not just that. Uh, the market is often portrayed in the counter-narrative as essentially interested in profit which it is, it does, but it doesn't just do that. And civil society in the counter narrative is shown as um, community, as cohesion, as, um, as, not being con as not being interested either in power, which is, uh, which is state, or in profit, which is market. And that their logic is different. The, their organization of life is different. And uh, so their values are different. Their um, modes of operations is different, decentralized as opposed to the state and market. And the institutions which operate there are very different from the market and the state, that these institutions are sort of decentralized, et cetera. And I think that narrative of counter development, um, we have tested that in many different countries. And I'm not so sure that the counter narrative uh, holds up. Uh, it's not wrong, but it's, it also paints it in a too much of a black and white, I think, 
uh, to the development narrative. And I think that it seems to me that, um, that, that, that uh, to convince people, uh, which is what, what uh, Amar is trying to do, convince people, convince policymakers, we need a different kind of narrative. And I was, as I was sitting and listening to his talk, and I was wondering, what would that narrative look like? What would it sound like? Or what would it show? For, for me to say, oh, this, is, this, this makes sense. And I will leave you with one, one of the ideas. I think, I think if you go to the field and do the work like Amar did, I am often taken not so much by the exploitation and the, and the injustices which exist very strongly. And, and I think there's an immense role for somebody like Amar, a social critic, to raise these issues. Um, but in a democratic country like India, with all its problems, and it is a procedural democracy, um, for people to demonstrate, to, to oppose, it's, it's, I, I was thinking, thank God that we at least can do that. I mean, if you compare that with, the, with what happened in Latin America in the 1970s, or even happening in many other parts of the world, um, the formal democratic structure allows us to voice grievances. And I think that, uh, of course, Amar is saying that's not enough. There's a huge amount of injustice, there's a huge amount of crime. So how would we substantiate, how would we complement this kind of procedural democracy with other things? And I think that what are those other things? So is it opposition of the kind that in Shusi and Chaturiga or, or basically armed revolt? Um, or are there other ways of substantiating uh, procedural democracy? And I think in this, let me leave with one last com comment that I have, is I think that in development theory, you know, when we look at development, we have a paradigm in our mind, so how things work. I think in, this, in the counter narrative, there is also a paradigm, unfortunately, which, um, which is somewhat predictable as a narrative. And I think that to capture the imagination of people, you essentially have to go to a field without a paradigm at all. And I think a paradigm, in a way, hurts you to understand the complexity and the grayness of the situation and it becomes um, somewhat simplified, which, which has its audience, which has its role. But I think in development literature, we have seen that for, I would say, at least 30 years, the counter narrative. And it hasn't been able to pick up steam. That doesn't mean that we have to dismiss it, saying it's not useful. I think that would be a, that would be a terrible thing to do. But we need to sharpen that narrative to be able to catch the imagination of the people that, that we are trying to convince in the policymaking world. Yeah. I would probably agree, which is, which is why I'm saying, uh, let's just first start with looking. Uh, and uh, let's start with poetry. And that um, possibly uh, it's not going there with a paradigm. It's going there. Uh, um, to see uh, and to find another way of communicating. And, and uh, if that is essentially what I'm saying, and that's essentially what I'm saying, may in some sense be at least a, a kind of a, um, say, a, an, an attracting force or a central force uh, for, uh, for more of it to gather around. And, and, and I am referring to um, since we are talking also in an, in an art context, I am referring to uh, um, a collection. I am referring to the expression of a collective voice or a collective imagination in a collective physical space uh, and in as many local areas as possible uh, as one, one way of responding. Uh, Thank you. Maybe you should open for, for your questions for, for Amar. You had commented that as the process multiplies or accelerates, I forget your exact words, it's, you 
see that it's losing its meaning. I, I'm not sure I understand that point. I wonder if you could explain it in more detail. Um, simply what I mean is that um, that when you see, uh, it's like if you make a set of films. Uh, after six months, you find that there, uh, it has triggered or inspired or catalyzed uh, maybe another 15, uh, which are quite exciting. Uh, and after some time, you see another 15, which are actually not that exciting. Uh, and um, so whether they are with other people or whether they are even with the same person or even with your own self, uh, there is a trajectory where you start losing uh, a, certain, uh, a certain quality of maybe uh, freedom, of multiplicity, of originality, of poetry, of risk-taking, uh, of... Uh, um, you know, trying to resolve newer and newer dilemmas aesthetically. Uh, and you find that you veer towards uh, a fairly well-established method of, of making, articulating, communicating, representing. And uh, I mean, if I were to push that a little further, I would, I would say, simply say that uh, I found that uh, it's, it's always very interesting if, if, if ethical, if ethical dilemmas are being addressed aesthetically, and if ethical dilemmas are continuously addressed aesthetically, then there is a uh, there is a consistency of that of those attempts, and the and if that consistency is articulated publicly and openly, then it's a really exciting terrain, and it's there that. Uh, you know, you keep on addressing uh, ethical dilemmas inadequately, aesthetically, and not completely, not perfectly. Uh, so every every attempt generates, uh, uh, you know, a certain form, a certain method. And the moment you stop doing that, you just immediately veer away to uh, to doing what is being prescribed, in a sense. And therefore, the response is also a prescribed response to it. That's what. I This question is about beauty, so it just follows with what you were just saying. Um, do you ever think, uh, when you, all of your projects, you're talking about translating into an aesthetic idea, an idea that's aesthetic rather than political or something else. Do you ever think about beauty when you do projects or when you engage a community? Um. I have often felt that if you think about, if you think that you are going to be beautiful, then you, you know you're pretty much sunk straight away. So, uh, so I mean, as a simple but true answer is that no, I don't think, uh, and I just make, and just respond and do exactly like I feel. Um, and so the real question about beauty actually probably comes in the intention. It's about why you're doing what you're doing, not, you know, when I find if I have to address the question of beauty, then instead of addressing beauty, I will in address intention. And if, I'm, if I can understand intention, then beauty will follow uh, if it has to or if it doesn't or whatever it is. That's one response. And uh, another response is that, uh, you know, I found that, uh, you know, the most beautiful poems about the most painful things. Uh, and um, that in some way, uh, you're able to actually transcend and speak about certain things as well in a certain way, uh, which uh, sometimes can be very, very beautiful as well. So uh, it's just that I, I, 
I find it, you know, I find it easier to, to be concerned with why I am doing things in the context of beauty. I'm not worried about aestheticizing anything. Uh, when I'm talking about, uh, say, uh, uh, resolving an, a, 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 a dilemma aesthetically, I'm not saying that resolving it by beauty or something like that. I'm, uh, so that's all. I would like beautifying it. I'm not, I don't mean that. Hi, thanks for your great talk and for your terrific response. And I, I wanted to follow up on a couple of things that were touched on but not really that explained in the talk or, or your response, which were questions around infrastructure. And Amar, I wondered how you participate in the local infrastructure of the villages that you visit, do you work with community groups? Do you um, liaison with different people? I mean, can you talk a little bit about the way that functions? And then I had another question for you as well, which is how do you see the efficacy of art making practices? Do you see it differently than a kind of direct address social policy or how, how, do, how do you see it? I mean, in, in um, my practice and my, the practice of many of my friends, the question when you do project-specific work often comes up of, okay, and you mentioned this at the beginning of your talk, how, what do you, how, how long do you engage? Where can you go with this? And, the, and I thought it was really great the way you talked about all the many different iterations over all these years. And I just wondered if you could expand on that. And then I also wondered if you see art as participating in social policy, and if so, how? Because I, I just wasn't clear when, with your remarks how you were framing that when you talked about not having a paradigm. And when I, uh, what was your last sentence? Oh, I, I was just asking about the, the lack of a par not having a paradigm because that forecloses you know, new solutions. and. New, new forms, since I, I I'd like to hear more about that. Thank you. Um, I mean, briefly, uh, um, but um, I think um, I, if I'm working with, I'm working with with uh, with like-minded people. I think that's how I would say. I would say that I'm working with activists, individuals. Uh, after meeting several and working with several over a period of time. Um, I kind of narrow down to work with people, um, essentially, just uh, that I get along with who are political activists, uh, or journalists, or media people, or uh, so it's a cross section of people. Uh, and uh, I've forgotten your second question. Sorry. Uh, it was. It was the, oh, sorry. It was how you're using, how you're seeing the art, the work that you're doing working culturally, or do you expect it to have a kind of direct effect um, in terms of policy making or, or no, I'm, transforming? I'm, see, there's, there's transforming. no confusion in my mind that actually if, if they are not resisting it, there's not very much anybody else can do. Uh, so, you know, if they are not holding out or if they are not, if, if the local community is not uh, um, uh, being able to do what it wants to do uh, or even exist or even resist, then uh, I do not envisage or do not put myself in any uh, kind of uh, uh, significant role uh, like that. So nor do I see my role as uh, something very significant either. Um, I am uh, not even thinking in terms of whether I am making a policy impact or, or do I wish to make a policy, even though with one of the films, I think to some extent we did manage to, but that's not how, how I'm thinking. As far as what I spoke about today and as far as the uh, illustrations that I gave today, my, my real interest actually is, is, um, is to learn how to work over a period of time in an area that is uh, continuously uh, in fluid and is in conflict. Uh, but to be available, to be accessible, to be to exist not just as an artist, but to exist as as many things, to exist as a person, as a filmmaker, as an artist, as as an activist, 
uh, as many things and to exist over a period of time in as many ways as I can. Uh, and my, uh, my objective is what he spoke about, which is uh, to explore, uh, if you may call it uh, a counter-narrative, uh, but to explore the possibility of it growing on its own and, and, and uh, multiplying on its own and, and, and finding it. So that, for me, that's where uh, I find more meaning um, of, uh, of just a lot of image making and a lot of interventions, artistic cultural intervention taking place locally. And what I can do to support it, where it goes is another matter. Can Let me just add, um, because you had or pointed your, your uh, second question, or second or third question. I think that policy making is very important. And I, I hope that people in India, the policy makers would see our work. And, I was thinking, if I was seeing it, and I'm a member, of, you know, advised the Indian Planning Commission many times on development projects, what would be my first response? Now, if I'm part of the state, am I just in the control and police force and unleashing brutality on the people, or is there other elements to the state? And the first thought would be, oh, maybe we should rethink before we locate these investments there. Maybe there should be a different process of of negotiation with the people, bringing the local people into the con in the conversation. Maybe we are not doing the right way, but not questioning the the broad objective which which Amar is saying. Why do you have to do this? So they would say, well, we'll still do development because our income is still very low. The poor people are in terrible situations. Let's not forget development. We have to do it, but let's do it in a more humane way, more participatory way. So that would be the first thought. The second would be the compensation issue that he raised. Oh, maybe if we just pay the right compensation, people are going to accept it. That's the problem. But I think the fundamental question that Amar is raising, why do they have to leave? Why, why, why do you need this here? Right? I think that kind of question of development, theory, basic premise of development, that things got to change, income got to increase, people got to live better, there has to be a school. We need a process for that. I don't know that, I, I would like to know what kind of narrative would make us question that very premise, which Gandhi, in a way, was close to raising in the early part, right? He was the one of the few people who raised those questions, and, well, we chose a different <laughs> option. Um, possibly somebody in the Planning Commission would also, a third thing may come up is that they may say that, oh, this is an, you know, they would start branding this as an extreme left propaganda kind of thing, or uh, which is another thing that mm. happens when you brand somebody as a terrorist or an extremist mm. or to, so it, yeah. to, to kind of uh, put it away. Mm. But uh, just a very small response to your question on the on uh, on not having a paradigm. It's not that not having a paradigm. It's actually of um, continuously trying the paradigm and and it, it losing it and then retrying it and then so coming up with newer and newer paradigms and not necessarily one kind of paradigm. Uh, so uh, sometimes the paradigm could be to not have a paradigm uh, as well and it's very hard to have not have a paradigm. Uh, it, you know, it's so it could be a lot of work to not have a paradigm. And the moment you get to the point of not having a paradigm, you start seeing immediately differently. And the moment you see differently, you construct a new paradigm, which takes you a little while forward, a little way forward, but then you have to dismantle it again. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's I think it's, that is. That's a good answer. Thank you. Something that you, you didn't talk about today was your move away from single channel video to quite extreme multiplicitous environments, so 18 strains of information. Um, and I was interested if you could say something about connecting this kind of multiplicity, these very multi multiplicitous environments with your statement about um, mainstream forms of communication, um, sort of essay form, documentary versus this more poetic approach. So, like what you're asking of people's attention and how you feel like that connects with them in a unique way. Yeah, well, I mean, it's not, I, I don't think I've in any, ever kind of indicated that 
poetry would exist in, in a multiple form, multiple installation form and not in a single channel form. I have not ever communicated that. I don't agree with that at all. So it's not, it's not like that. Uh, um, so that is an incorrect kind of you know, assumption. Um, however, I presume what you're talking about is, say, the desire or the need to get into a multiple installation form and, you know, what does that mean? Which is, you know, becomes an eternal question. I mean, if you're multiple and you move to single, then you will have the same, you know, another set of questions as to why. But um, I think um, for me, probably it's not, it's not a rule, it's not something that I'm taking and I think it, but I think uh, what I found quite interesting in the last few years was uh, that, um, and you know, maybe this was just for me and is not a big deal for anybody else, and so, but still it was for me, which is that uh, I felt that when I, um, uh, I, since I have filmed many times in, in not just a conflict situation but in a political situation or tried to film a social movement or a political movement, I have felt, or even a community, and even if I have done a halfway decent job, uh, afterwards I have felt uh, uncomfortable. Uh, and I have felt it at a bit of a loss because I felt that I, I, I actually was not able to uh, communicate several things that were happening there that I could see, that I knew, but I didn't have the vocabulary to do that. Uh, which is also similar sometimes, you know, I saw that glance and I knew exactly what that glance meant but there was no way I could bring the glance in or even indicate to what it meant for a whole bunch of reasons. So uh, you go into a town or a village or a street and you see there are multiple realities also that are existing. And again, uh, you know, in the earlier ways or in certain ways of making, I would feel that I've been unable to do this. Even in, say, um, uh, the question of poetry, uh, if I'm talking about, uh, you know, uh, memo me uh, photographs of memorial stones, if I'm talking about photographs of, uh, there have been, you know, several thousand farmers who have committed suicide in this state. Um, or if I'm talking about uh, images of the land and of water. Um, I, I found that when I was working with installations, not necessarily projected installations, but installations in different registers, somehow I was getting a sense, a simultaneous sense of time, uh, of multiple time, so, and of uh, the passage of multiple time, at the same time, you know, in the same place. And uh, maybe this is an inadequate description, but whenever some, as, you know, uh, that kind of a situation would happen, I felt that, uh, you know, suddenly my, the, 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 the depth of my understanding of what I was seeing, uh, you know, uh, increased. I related to what was happening at many levels. If I was able to see uh, multiple, the passage of multiple time simultaneously. And that is the reason why, uh, in a sense, I, I you know, move towards maybe 19, maybe 18, 8, and maybe even if it is a physical space, um, maybe much more than 19, maybe 50, maybe 70, uh, but uh, all inter, inter, interconnected in a way. Thank you very much for a wonderful uh, lecture. Um, my question is that uh, because you were talking about the project that you were uh, you filmed in uh, uh, Odisha State in India, 
I kind of assumed that you were talking about your own issue as an Indian uh, person or um, artist. But for example, if you are filming in different country or in different, you are uh, you are uh, <coughs> filming in different um, um, issues in different cultures. Do you think you are interested in doing this, or you are still um, trying to have a connection with your own cult uh, Indian, um, I mean subcontinent uh, culture? Uh, because I saw your uh, work filmed in um, Sweden Norway. or Norway, and it, it was about the exile ex, uh, um, experience. So I wonder you can talk about a little bit more about that. Did, sh did I make sense? <laughs> yeah, no, you did. But uh, I mean, this is a big question. But um, uh, uh, maybe yes, perhaps I'm, you know, I feel unsure. I've shot in, in the United States as well. I've filmed in the United States as well. Um, but yes, I am, uh, I still seem to be uh, happy within the subcontinent. And, and, um, and I think, I, you know, I don't have a problem. I think I'm quite, uh, I, I, uh, to keep revisiting the same thing from different directions, uh, I'm quite comfortable with doing that over and over again. Um, because there's, every time I'm doing it, there is some, I get a bit, bit more of an understanding. Uh, besides, um, uh, I, um, filming about Burma in Norway, filming about Burma in Fort Wayne uh, in the United States, as I did. Um, I, what it helps me is something that we were talking about today. This, this project that I referred to today in, in, in my talk is, is, is titled The Sovereign Forest. So uh, while um, you know many of the issues, uh, I've not referred to the question of sovereignty, but uh, I am referring to the question of sovereignty uh, and wanting to open it up and to rediscuss uh, sovereignty. And in that sense, um, uh, it's not just India that, uh, because even the, the, the boundaries and the constructs of the Indian nation are quite uh, complicated and uh, cannot be just taken as they were given to us. So it's uh, necessary to respond to the region. Uh, and so therefore, uh, you know, it's not India that I will film in, but I think I will fil keep filming in the region. So. Oops. Yeah, I think, sorry. I think this, this was um, very, good, um, I think, also rounding up of this uh, series that started uh, with uh, Survival International, actually also dealing uh, when, uh, how an NGO was dealing with the notion of uh, multi-corporations entering uh, territories of indigenous um, population and indigenous groups um, who don't have a voice uh, to communicate. They would not enter areas where basically um, people are articulated and have channels, have their own radios, etc. So I thought it's also, um, I also forget to mention before that we awarded you the first Edward Munch Award when I was working in Norway, specifically also because um, for your capacity as an artist also to be a witness. And um, being a witness and bringing, um, th you s mentioned it as a forensic evidence, but I think also um, there's different evidences yeah, no, I'm countering forensic evidence. Yeah, and, and I think th this is very critical to also to place um, those um, documents of being a witness in other context. And I think that is very critical because also in terms of its duration, because um, in the arts we have um, the ability to have a longer duration sometimes than day-to-day -day media, like which is much more fast, which has a um, quicker response. And to implement those um, documents of being a witness in a museum or in a fi film festival, having accessible later on in a library as a writer, I think is so critical. Because as we know, history repeats itself. And I think it's very critical to have those documents in it. I mean, despite of the fact that um, along with your wife, you achieved quite a lot of uh, I would say real-time changes also in the areas where you're active. 
uh, Amar's wife is a human rights lawyer, and maybe you can mention just, I mean, she, they won, uh, was it yesterday or just now, like a, a very critical case in India, and I think this, um, having also a valid voice, I think is very critical too. And maybe you want to mention something about the case, because I thought that's quite stunning. Um, the, the case is about um, uh, an extrajudicial killing or an encounter which, uh, of a young Muslim girl from Bombay, uh, where she was uh, killed and um, uh, presented as a terrorist on way uh, to do a mission to assassinate the chief minister of Gujarat, so the police um, killed her and her friends and presented them as members of um, a terrorist organization. So uh, the case that um, Brinda was working on was, which you're referring to, is, is actually to, was to, um, in a sense, prove that this was, this was, an, was an illegal killing and this was a murder by the police and that she was not actually um, you know, part of an operation or anything of that sort. So, uh, but what this actually, uh, you know, points out is even, even, it's hard to kind of, you know, uh, refer to all the things that are happening, but this development paradigm is also accompanied by, um, uh, by large scale killings uh, of various kinds. Uh, and so you, uh, people are facing, I mean, the images that I showed you uh, of the children and women lying down, uh, just they're basically human blockades. Um, their lived experience of the last five, five years, it's six years, I think, they, yeah, it's six years they have uh, prevented uh, the South Korean steel company, POSCO, from coming into and taking over their area. Uh, and it's, I think, the largest foreign investment uh, um, in India. But for, for the last six years, they have quite clearly seen that, um, that there is an alliance. There is an alliance between the company. There is an obvious alliance between the state, the bureaucracy, the police, and, and, and the company, uh, and even the judiciary. Uh, and you know, they may not, it may not be that clear in six months, but in six years it becomes pretty crystal clear. So uh, the, the case that you refer to is a case of uh, a killing and, and there, have, there are several kinds of killings that take place and have been taking place um, either, either through the police or uh, through, uh, you know, privately, through private mafias of uh, people who resist. And, and uh, there have been many civil rights organizations that have now actually, you know, have been working and trying to figure out a way of, um, you know, how to, you know, how to protect those who are actually um, uh, involved in local resistances. And so that's also a big issue. Yeah, just thought it's, it's also good sometimes to show that um, justice is possible. And, uh, no, well, justice is the, the <laughs> justice is not yet possible because this the the, the development yesterday was about uh, getting the police to admit mm -hmm. that this was murder. The, it has it, the, and now after that they will mm -hmm. they will have to you know. Uh, but just, yes, to some extent, I just justice thought it's is remarkable. Yeah. Like I yeah. mean, that is what Bish is referring that it was remarkable. It could be brought to a court. Yeah. I mean, it it does not make mm. them alive, but it could be brought to a court and actually the case was won. I mean, that's already yeah. also remarkable. Those responsible for the murder are not yet in, you see. Yeah. So it, the fact that it was a murder mm. is what has, we have reached there. We have not reached, mm. um, you know, conviction, so, which is pretty big uh, anyhow. So uh, I agree, yes. I'm just not very hopeful, that's all, that's why I keep saying. <laughs> well, I think it's, as we face so many conflicts and, and problematics where that is not even possible, I mean, Bish was referring to that. I don't think that's ideal, but I think it's really already amazing and it's amazing that people follow the, the, 
the many years it takes to tackle down something like that, and also what you do with the films, this is engagement over many, many years in very small steps, and I think that is also maybe the different timing uh, than you have to have in uh, journalism or so, when you often, you have to get to the point where quickly you were mentioning success and results. Mm -hmm. And I think this kind of duration uh, of engagement I think is very unique and maybe that is a quality that we can bring in from the field of the arts to engage over a long period of time. I mean, I don't say we have the finances for it, but I think the, the engagement is often very present and I think that is very critical. So I really want to thank uh, both of you for this closing of the series. Thank um, you. I really want to thank uh, the audience and your questions because like an evening like that is only as interesting as the questions you pose after it. And so I really thank you also for staying tuned also over uh, the series. I really hope um, you come to the few events that we have left over the, the term. And then I also, as mentioned before, I welcome you back in the spring when Rennie Green, uh, my colleague, will take over uh, the series. And um, I'm sure it will be as interesting as always. And we will be in the same room. And we hope to see you all back in the spring. So thank you very much. Thank you.